quitting your job seems like a personal issue. In this paper, however, I want to explain that it can also be a political deed. It's the moment when you decide, do I play along, try to change the system from within, or do I feel that I can no longer participate in a specific system and that I need to take another route? I decided to do the latter and quit my job as a socio-political deed. As a background, I worked for 12 years at a commercial company that was part of the University of Amsterdam, and most of the, the time to my enjoyment. The pay was good, and I even did a PhD with, while working there. The company did all right, and we had made a conscious decision to stay small and focus on quality instead of quantity. We were a bit more expensive than other commercial companies, but we had a good reputation. We only took projects that fitted into our research agenda, which added to the quality of our products and research. Then the university wanted that the different commercial companies within the university made more money. Due to their own messy administration, they thought that the archaeological company did not make enough money to stay visit viable. The assessment was pure speculation, because they didn't have the numbers, and the director of the company was set aside and in came the managers. I have no idea what the first manager did, but it was not helping the company. And she worked there for a year. The second manager was clear about his goals, but had no idea what archaeology was or how the playing field worked. Hoping against odds and thinking that we might influence the new development and basically writing the business plan myself, I stayed on. Until the day came, the new strategy was exposed and I was told that knowledge was not important. I was too old, costed too much, and an archaeologist with a BA could do what I did. I wondered this, if this included writing the business plan, which was clearly the job of the manager, but he knew too little to do it. They did not fire me, but I decided it was time to send a message and quit. That was a move they did not expect. Me choosing to leave gave some other colleagues courage to do the same. And I would say the most engaged of them left as well. Here one of the first issues comes to <coughs> light. The turning away from archaeology of our most talented piece people because they do not feel they can use their potential to the fullest within commercial archaeology. So how is this a political deed? As a student, there were two main influences on my ideas of archaeology as political. The first influence was the books of Schenk and Tilly, who stated in Social Archaeology and Theory that the point of archaeology is not merely to interpret the past, but to change the manner in which the past is interpreted in the service of social construction in the present. And a bit further, that interpretation in archaeology constructs a social, political supposition in the process of engagement with the artifactual traces of the past. I translated it into my own work in the sense that I write about has a political influence. So for example, when I write about that the nuclear family was the main feature of prehistoric social life, I normalize and neutralize this type of family and give it a deep history Hereby, I make other forms of living together less natural and leave them open to critique. For me, their work related especially to the theories and interpretations that we construct. Although Shanks and Tilly take their argument into the practice of archaeology and related power structures, I did not pick up on this as a student, as I was already overwhelmed by the consequences for my theoretical development. But it did open up my mind in such a way that when I read my second influence, uh, Anthony Giddens, The Constitution of Society, that the whole idea that archaeology in all its facets is political became clear. In short, Giddens states that in structuration theory, structure is regarded as rules and resources recursively implicated in social production. Roughly translated, rules over time become institutions such as law, tradition and power structures, that influence and are at the same time influenced by researchers, which are material and human agency. 
What is important is that every little resource and rule has its influence on how society is shaped. This means that every person has influence either by conforming to the rules or by challenging the rules. Everybody has a certain amount of power. Even though a lot of people feel powerless, it is not true that they do not have power. It is more that people have no idea how to utilize the power they have. And this lack of knowledge is usually to the advantage of the existing power structures. Effective institutions pose themselves as natural or the only way forward. Those institutions give people the false idea that they cannot be challenged or changed. Of course this is not true, but a choice of tactics. Neoliberalism, neoliberalism is one of those institutions that poses itself as the only viable and natural option for society move, to move forward. It has infiltrated our political system in the way it pushes for free market in every sector of society and has led to a massive decentralization. Even the politic political left has in many instances embraced the idea that public services are better off in the hands of the free market. Of course, what the neoliberalism left out was that the free market only works in the, present, in the presented manner for the good of all, if everybody can decide whether they need the product they want to buy or not buy. It does not work for everybody when the product is a necessity, like healthcare and water, or when it's compulsory by law, such as archaeology. When the Convention of Valletta was signed, it seemed a good thing for archaeology, and in general it is. This, the, particular lead, however, to a dif the particulars lead, however, to a different situation. I will now turn to the Dutch way the con Convention was implemented and the devastating effect it has on my profession, in my view. In the Netherlands, they opted for a model of free market in which certified companies bid on archaeological products. In order to guarantee a certain level of quality, a set of regulations such as the quality norm archaeology and the register of archaeologists were put in place. The regulations were done from the bottom up, so the archaeological field was the main input combined with an idea of management that is all about easy checks. I'm not going to make me popular by saying what I'm going to say next, but the archaeologists who produced the regulations and checks were ill-equipped for the job. They had a naivety about how important archaeology is for the people who had to pay for it all, namely the developers. They had not thought through the theoretical consequences of the way they set up the regulations, because they were still, they were and still are convinced that collecting data is objective and theory only comes in when you start interpreting the data. The regulations are putting disabled archaeologists and archaeologists who work part-time, <coughs> that is especially women, in a disadvantage, <coughs> as it is really hard to become a senior archaeologist. And they took the idea from the managers that easy checks and on procedural steps are important <coughs> instead of putting some effort into thinking about what archaeological and uh, scientific quality really means. They took over the language of the developers instead of transferring scientific language into the new system of regulations. <coughs> I will explain four set points in some more detail. The free market system does not work in archaeology because most buyers do not want or need the product archaeology is selling. So they go for the cheapest option or try to avoid buying at all. With the decentralization of government, the municipality is the level on which politics, policies are made and at the same time they are often the developers. So it can be imagined that the local government has a conflict of interest. Archaeology is expensive and when they have to choose between old stuff and healthcare, I don't blame them for picking the last one. Furthermore, archaeology has become fragmented as every development is seen as a separate project and the whole proce process is started again each time. So different companies can excavate next to each other without an overarching perspective. The national research agenda is meant to counter this, but for their questions are 
For this, their questions are too broad and conservative. The new web-based questions of the research are agenda are even more processual, if that is possible. I typed in Iron Age and Akersloot, that's the place where I was born, but it's also my research area. And one of the questions was, how are sa sacrificial landscapes situated and structured, and how long were they in use? This is not very helpful when you do a little excavation. Furthermore, in general, the explanation they talk about has, is talking about another part of the Netherlands, and they sort of forgot to mention my PhD, which is about a subject and has some qualitative predictive models. So it's clearly a failed system. And this is not just for my perspective, but it's because they just don't have all the ideas put in there. This overarching perspective could also be reached if every developer just paid archaeotechs. Then provincial archaeologists decide what really needs to be excavated because of information gain instead of just small half-done projects which are done because they just happen to have something archaeological there. So once we have overcome the free market and start excavating, the whole process is treated like archaeologists are building houses. There is a plan or design of demands from which follows a design of the approach. Both has to encompass the quality norm Dutch archaeology. The questions to be answered are written down and usually they are of the most general type. Furthermore, how nowhere it asks where the company's theoretical stance is and what their related method of excavation. This is not surprising as the design often explicates how many samples you can take, where to put your trends and how deep to go. I have even seen them ex explicate that you only have to research one half of a feature uh, because they see archaeology as a random process. But it's put forward as an objective way of documenting. It also assumes that no matter who performs the excavation, the results will be the same. A combination between theory and method has been left out completely and her archaeology has become landscape sanitation. I've been to many meetings where it was said, you cannot check a theory, that is all interpretation. Well, if that is true, then we have left the realm of science. We may not agree on a theory, but it should be possible to evaluate if the theory is compatible with data collected with a certain method. If archaeologists can't do that, it's a doomed profession. What is meant is, I cannot check that, or that takes effort to check, and it leads to, you know what, if we just make these little check boxes that check the process, such that did you draw a feature? And when that box is checked, the quality of the excavation is assured. And the bonus is, any manager without archaeological um, knowledge can see if all the boxes are checked. Another point was that disabled archaeologists, and part-timers especially, were put at a disadvantage. For them it's very difficult to get a promotion. I already explicated this in the paper Diversity in Archaeological Past on the Present, on TAG in 2011. But in short, when you don't do or do not have a lot of field work and you are not an artifact specialist, you cannot become a senior archaeologist, even if you have a PhD, which means that you cannot write reports on your own, even when it's desk research. So the Dutch now have a non-inclusive system that is totally manageable and lost most of its signs. For, we, for me, when one of the last companies that tried to be scientific also turned to the ma management component, I felt I could no longer work in Dutch commercial archaeology, and I quit my job. I no longer wanted to take part in a system that destroyed all that is beautiful about my profession. This point goes a bit further than Dutch commercial archaeology sucks, and I hope it makes you think about what you to want to do when policies are developed in your own country, or the country you're working in. To end on a more positive note, this is not the end of me as an archaeologist, and although I no longer get paid, I still utilize my archaeological skills, and I now have the freedom to do archaeology in a more political way. I became interested in contemporary archaeology because of its direct connection to the socio-political world we live in, and it has the added benefit that it's completely unregulated because it's not officially recognized as heritage. So I take advantage of the hoop loopholes in the archaeological system. My biggest project up to now has been participatory research into Occupy Rotterdam. 
I followed them for a year and combined ordinary archaeological skills such as mapping and documenting objects with social science skills such as questionnaires. For me it was important to document a movement that is ephemeral in its traces but which has an impact on the way we discuss society, social, economics and politics. I felt it added to the research that took a political standpoint supporting Occupy. This does not mean that I was non-scientific, but that I was aware of the questions I uh, put forward and where my goals were. One of the most important outcomes of my research was used towards the media, and it countered the idea that the majority of people in the Occupy camps were drunk and unemployed, as was suggested by the main media. But the occupiers were all working small jobs and doing all uh, they could in the little time they left over. My graphs were even used in an article in a popular magazine and it helped gain the group more credibility. And through my engagement with Occupy, I gained a lot of socio-political insight into the harsh reality of a police state. In the last few weeks, years, I've worked mainly as an artist. And my, one of my major themes is how knowledge is produced, spread and evaluated. Through the Museum of Failure and Unloved Objects, I try to explore this path and make the audience question the information they receive. The museum collects material left over by society and shapes it into small exhibitions. This repurposing of material cultures tries to make people think about their relation to the objects they're surrounded with and the consumption and discard of these objects. And with every project I do, I try to give people tools to really realize they have power and if they utilize it in the right way, we can make social-political changes. Thank you.